guys, I'm your host, Tara A. Devlin, and welcome to this week's episode of Kowabana, True Japanese Scary Stories from Around the Internet. As we're nearing our 100th episode, I thought I'd do another slightly longer episode this week, celebrating yet another classic that we haven't yet featured on the show. This story was shared on Nii Channel back in 2009, and it instantly became a hit, one that people still talk about today. It's a meaty story with an ending you won't soon forget. And as a small note before we start, you may or may not have noticed that many of these stories don't give anyone names. They're usually Eisan, Bikun, and so on, or often just represented by a circle or an X. For the purposes of this story, the main character refers to their friend in text as two circles, which in Japanese would be pronounced marumaru. As such, that's what I'll be saying throughout the story as well. And with that out of the way, let's head right in. This one's called... Real. I'll say this first. If you ever get possessed, targeted, or shadowed, it's seriously not funny. And another thing, if you'll let me speak from experience, There's no guarantee that everything will be fine even if you perform a purification once or twice. It'll eat away at you over a long period of time. There are a lot of things that can't be exercised at all. In my case, it's been about two and a half years. At any rate, as time has passed I've been able to live normally and in good health. But, unfortunately, I can't be sure that it's all over. Let me start from the beginning. I was 23 at the time. It was the first anniversary of starting full-time work as an adult, and I was enjoying my new lifestyle to the fullest. I worked for a small company, and of course, there weren't too many colleagues who joined at the same time as myself. So, naturally, we got along well. There was one guy from Tohoku, Marumaru, who knew a lot of stuff and also a frightening amount of people. You know how people will come up to you and say things like, if you do this, then this will happen, or something mysterious will appear, right? I think those types of stories are nonsense, but it's not that strange that a few of them might occasionally be true. So, according to this guy, if a certain number of unspecified conditions all manage to line up by chance, something weird would happen. As for me, well, my joking around was probably the root of the problem. I'd just bought a car and started living by myself, but none of that was a match for the fun I had on weekends after my pay came in. Around the start of August, I went out on a double date with Marumaru and a girl that I was getting friendly with. We went to a so-called ghost spot to test our courage. The place was most definitely scary. I got the chills and felt like there was something there, but nothing really happened. And after we'd had our fun, we went home. Three days later. There was an unspoken rule at work that the new employees couldn't leave until the boss did, so I worked late every day. I was tired when I got home, and when I try to remember it now, it doesn't make any sense, but... I did something I shouldn't have in front of the mirror near the entrance to my room. It wasn't like I was thinking about doing it, it just happened. Let me explain in a little more detail. My apartment at the time was a 15 minute walk from the station. It was a single eight tatami mat room. From the front door there was a narrow hallway and at the end was the room. The mirror was at the entrance to the room. In other words, on the border of the room and the hallway. I heard a story from Marumaru that said, if you stand in front of the mirror and look right while doing this, this will appear. This was a kind of pose like bowing to someone. There's no way anything will appear, I muttered. And then I bowed and looked right. Something was in the middle of my room. It was clearly abnormal. 
It was about 160 centimetres tall, I think. Its hair was wild and about hip length, draped over its face like a blind. I mean, there were a bunch of charms or something pasted all over it, so I couldn't see its face. I don't know what it's called, but it was wearing white Japanese-style clothes, like what a deceased person might wear, and it was vibrating left and right. I froze. I was unable to say anything, and I couldn't move an inch. My mind was racing a thousand miles a minute trying to understand what was going on. I want you to try and imagine it. There was something in the middle of this tiny, silent room. Although my brain knew the cause of it, it was confused and couldn't understand what was taking place before me. It was just strange. I turned the light on, but that just made it even more terrifying. I could see it better. The air around it was blue. It was so quiet that it felt like time itself had stopped. At any rate, I came to the conclusion that I had to get out of the room. For some reason, I reached for the bag at my feet slowly and cautiously. I couldn't take my eyes off the thing. I thought if I did, something terrible would happen. I walked backwards, and around halfway down the hall, Normally, this would be about three steps, but it took an extremely long time. The things vibrating became more violent. At the same time, it started muttering something. I don't really remember much after that. When I came back too, I was inside the convenience store in front of the station. More than anything, I was relieved that I had made it to a store full of people. But of course, I was still confused. I was filled with a feeling close to rage, like, what the hell was that? But also, a strange calmness, like wondering whether I stopped to lock the door on my way out. But I didn't have enough courage to return to my apartment, so I spent the night at a family restaurant and waited for morning. As the sky started to get light, I nervously opened the door to my apartment. Thank. God, it was gone. I stepped back outside and finished a can of coffee while having a smoke. I started to think that nothing had been there in the first place. There's no way something like that could exist. It was getting brighter and the thing was gone, so I regained my composure. I entered the room more boldly than before. All right, it's gone, I thought. The curtains were closed, so the room was dim. I turned the lights on. A scene that supported the events of the night before greeted my eyes. There was this foul-smelling mud, probably slime, on the floor where that thing had been standing. Enough to cover my feet. It didn't take long to remember what happened again. I didn't turn the lights off. (laughs) As soon as I realized, panic began to rise within me once more. I found the switch with my left hand and when I looked at it, it was also covered in mud. I was unable to escape the heavy feeling within me for a while, but if there was a ghost, what could I do? This is probably indicative of my blood type, AB, but I went and cleaned up the mud had a shower, and then went to work. It pissed me off that I couldn't get rid of the smell and there were problems everywhere. But it was also important not to miss work. When I got there, everything was normal. I tried to find some time to talk to Madumaru. He was the cause of all this, so I wanted to get whatever information I could from him. I finally got a hold of him at lunchtime. The following is a brief extract of the conversation we had. You told me about that thing where if you do this, such and such will appear, right? Well, I tried it yesterday, and it worked. Huh? What are you talking about? I'm telling you, something appeared. For real. Ah, yeah, yeah. You saw Kalpa? 
Are you screwing with me? I saw something dangerous. I have no idea what you're talking about. I'm the one who has no idea. This was no good. We weren't getting anywhere. If I couldn't get him to believe me, I wouldn't be able to understand what was going on. So I explained to him again what happened the day before. At first he thought I was joking, but finally he started to come around. After work he came around to my apartment to check. It was around 10pm. We were thankfully able to get away from work early and I arrived home with Maru Maru in tow. The moment I opened the door, we were assaulted by the bad smell I smelt that morning. It had gotten even worse in the heat of the closed up room all day. I explained everything in excessive detail to Maru Maru on the way over, but he still muttered, Seriously? He finally seemed to believe me. The problem was whether Maru Maru would be able to come up with a plan to help me. I shouldn't have held up too much hope for that. He just told me I should have the place purified and that he'd ask a friend about it. Then he left. I don't know what else I should have expected, but I held out hope that he'd know someone who could help. I didn't want to be around that smell any longer, so I spent the night in a capsule hotel. But honestly, I thought that if that thing appeared again, it would all be over. The next day I stopped by a nearby temple. It was no time to be going to work, not with everything else going on. I explained what was going on to the monk. I'm not a specialist, so I don't know. How about you try take it easy? It's probably just your imagination. What a carefree answer. Guys like this really existed, huh? I went to visit various shrines and temples around town, but they were all the same. Exhausted, I asked for help back home in Saitama. To be honest, I wanted to talk to a priestess called S-sensei, who knew my grandmother on my mother's side. I mean, other than her, I couldn't think of anyone else who could help me. Let me introduce her to you. My mother was born in Nagasaki Prefecture, and of course, my grandmother was too. Perhaps because of her experiences in the war, my grandmother became a fervent Buddhist. This S-sensei was the chief priestess of a temple slash private residence that my grandmother visited once a week. I'd met her several times before. I don't know the finer details, but she was part of a sect large enough to appear in textbooks and carried out her work reliably, not like those sham mediums you always hear about. She was gentle, calm, and spoke kindly. When I was about to enter junior high school, my father bought a plot of land and wanted to build a house on it. What do you call it? The groundbreaking ceremony? Anyway, the land was purified. About a week later, my grandmother from Nagasaki called us and said, There's something wrong with that land, so S-sensei is going to come and purify it. Of course, my mother was like, It's already been purified, so why? S-sensei said there's still something lingering there, my grandmother replied. In other words, S-sensei was the only person I could rely on who might know what to do. The sun went down, and it was just before 9pm when I arrived at the bus stop near my family home in Saitama. In complete contrast to the city, it was nothing but factories, so at that time of night, no one was around. It was about a 20 minute walk home from the bus stop, if I walked quickly. Street lights lit the empty streets at regular intervals along the way. I had flashbacks to what happened two nights earlier and was a little frightened, but thankfully, I didn't see that thing again. But the night was rather cool, and I noticed something strange within my own body. It's a little difficult to explain, but it was like a rope was strung around my neck, and I was swaying side to side. I grabbed my neck and got chills. It was hot. Just my neck was hot to the touch. Not only that, 
It started stinging. It was like I was breaking out into a rash. I couldn't walk any further. I ran the whole way home. I opened the front door, out of breath, right as my mother was hanging up the phone. She looked at my face and said, Ah, it's you. Your grandmother just called. She was worried about you. S-sensei said something bad happened to you and asked for you to come visit her. Did something happen? Oh dear, what happened to your neck? I looked in the mirror by the door before I could answer. I didn't even think I might see that thing again. Why? My neck was bright red around the base, like a rope was tied around it. Looking closer, I could see thousands of bumps raised closely together. As you would expect, I started to tremble. Without thinking, I went upstairs, not saying a thing to my mother. I started praying before the altar in her room. There was nothing else I could do. What's wrong? My father's angry voice called out, and he came running into the room. My mother, sensing something was wrong, was on the phone with my grandmother again. I heard her voice. She was crying. There was nowhere I could run to. At that point, I realized just what a terrible situation I was in. Three days had passed since the situation I brought upon myself and my arrival at home. On the second day, I broke out in a fever. I don't know whether it was because of my mental state or because of that thing I saw. I was sweating furiously from my neck, and around lunchtime that day, it started to bleed. On the morning of the third day, the blood stopped. My fever also came down and things started to calm somewhat. But my neck was still abnormally itchy. It prickled and stung painfully. Every time I touched the pillow or futon or a towel, it was like a sharp stabbing pain. I thought it had to be itchy from the scabs caused by the bleeding, so I made a conscious effort not to touch them. I got back into the futon and tried not to pay any attention to it, but in the evening I needed to go to the toilet, and, concerned, I looked in the mirror. Even though I didn't want to, I wanted to see what was happening to me, and I couldn't settle down until I saw with my own two eyes. What I saw in the mirror was something I'd never seen before. The redness was completely gone, but in return, the rash was even bigger. It was so gross that even thinking about it now I get goosebumps. I'm going to dare to give you a more detailed picture of it. Please don't be grossed out. Originally, the line around my neck was about one centimeter thick. It turned bright red, and comparing it to my pale skin, it looked like a red cord tied around my neck. This was before the third day. What I saw in the mirror that day, however, was an accumulation of pus. No, that's not quite correct. The rash that caused the red line around my neck was full of pus. It was like a breakout of really large pimples. Most of these pimples burst and I was so grossed out that I threw up. I washed my neck with clean water, got some ointment from my mother, put it on and got back into the futon while crying. I couldn't think. The only thing running through my head was, why me? When I was done crying, the phone rang. It was Marumaru. At a time like this, even the smallest bit of hope gave me a rush of energy. Honestly, I'd never received a happier call. Hello? Hey, you okay? No. No, I'm not okay. Ah, it's gotten worse then. That doesn't even come close. (sighs) Ah. Did you find out anything? Yeah, so I asked a friend from back home about it, but nobody knows anything. Sorry, eh? Ah. And? Honestly, I thought Marumaru would do what he always did and find something out for me. 
and considering my situation, I had no time to be considerate, so I probably sounded somewhat selfish as I spoke to him. No, but instead I found a guy that's supposed to be really good with stuff like this. I can introduce you, but it'll cost you. I gotta pay? Yeah, seems like it. What do you want to do? <sighs> How much? According to my buddy, at least 500,000 yen. 500,000 yen? Even though I was working at the time, it wasn't like I was in a position to be paying that much money. But although money was precious to me, if it could break me free of the fear and pain I was in, there was no other choice. All right, when can you introduce me? Apparently he's in Gunma Prefecture right now. I'll ask my buddy about it again, so hang on. Returning to earlier in the story, my mother was on the phone with my grandmother when I was praying in front of the altar. She said she would talk to S-sensei right away. And by talk, she meant that she would plead for help. And in the end, they decided that S-sensei would come and see me instead. But S-sensei was not only busy, but getting on in years as well. It would be over three weeks before she could come, which meant I would be wrapped up in fear and worry that whole time. I couldn't bear it. I had to do something. Marumaru called me back after 11 that night. Sorry for making you wait. I spoke to my friend and he got in contact with the guy. He said he can come see you tomorrow. Tomorrow? Tomorrow's Sunday, yeah? Oh yeah. Before I knew it, five days had passed since I saw that thing. I had strangely forgotten all about work. Okay, thank you. He'll come here directly? Yeah, that's what he said. He's driving, so send me your address. What are you going to do? I'd like for you to be here as well. I'm going to go too. Can I pay him later? Mm, that should be fine, I reckon. Okay, well, when you get close, just give me a call. It wasn't the best arrangement, but I was young, so it was hard to avoid. That night, I had a dream. A woman in white Japanese-style clothing was sitting on her knees beside me as I slept. She placed her hands politely before her knees and bowed her head deeply before getting up to leave. She bowed deeply once more by the door before exiting the room. I didn't know if the dream was connected to that thing I saw, though. The next day, Marumaru called me after lunch. I explained to him over the phone how to get to my parents' house. He arrived with his friend and a guy in his late thirties. He didn't seem like any regular old guy. He gave off small-time Yakuza vibes, and I had no idea what he did for a living. I hadn't explained to my parents what was going on, so they were suspicious. I have no doubt it was an alias, but the man said his name was Hayashi. I heard about what happened to Tikun from my friend here. It's a bit of a bother, isn't it? Hayashi said. T was referring to me, of course. The friend was Marumaru. And what connection do you have to all of this? My father asked. Oh, I'm just a novice to all this and may be of no help at all. But sir, do you mind if I try? If things continue like this, Tikun will be in danger. I came here because my friend said that his friend, Tikun, needed help. He's in danger? My mother asked. Well, I've had several experiences like this before, but honestly, this is the first time I've seen a case so bad. This room is full of bad energy. I'm sorry, but do you mind if I ask what you do for a living? My father said. Ah, do you really want to know? Of course, We'd just showed up suddenly out of nowhere, so I'd be suspicious too. But if we don't exercise your son and clear the bad energy, he will be spirited away. 
Um, can we trust you with this? My mother said. Of course. Leave it to me. Only someone with skills like myself can do this. But listen, Mum, this is dangerous for both your son and myself. It's going to cost a little, you know? You get what I'm saying? How much? My father asked. Let's see. Well, I think about two million. Are you serious? I came all this way, on my own time, because our friend here asked me to help out. If you don't want me here, then it's nothing to me. I have no stake in this. But if just two million yen is going to help Tikun here, isn't that a fair price? Not only that, Tikun went to visit various temples and no one would help him, right? There are only a handful of people that can deal with a problem like this. Would you like to start searching for someone from scratch again? I listened to them talk in silence. Of course, the moment I heard two million yen, I looked up at Marumaru, but he just looked uncomfortable. In the end, my parents had nothing else to say on the matter and reluctantly agreed to his terms. Hayashi stated his intentions to start the exorcism right away. He said he needed to get ready and left the house. He received some money from my parents to get the things he needed. He returned in the evening and set about preparing candles and covering the walls of the room in paper talismans. He lay a crystal ball by his knees and gripped a rosary, then poured what I think was sake into a cup. Everything was starting to take shape. Tikun, I'm going to perform the exorcism now. You're going to be okay. Mother, father, I'm sorry, but could I get you to leave the house for a moment? There's a chance the spirit might head for you after. My parents reluctantly went to wait in the car outside. As the sun began to set and things got dark, he began the exorcism. Hayashi chanted sutras and touched the sake cup at regular intervals, then flicked the liquid on me. I lay on the futon with my eyes closed, like Hayashi told me to, dubious about the whole situation. A considerable amount of time passed since the start of the exorcism. Hayashi's voice began to break as he chanted the sutras. As I lay there with my eyes closed, the atmosphere began to worsen, and all I could understand were the prayers, which were gradually getting stranger. I didn't notice it at first, but my neck was starting to hurt. A lot. It was beyond itchiness. It was clearly painful. If I didn't open my eyes, I wouldn't be able to bear the pain any longer. But then, the sutras stopped. But something was strange. It was like he stopped mid-sentence, and he didn't tell me that he was finished either. But the pain in my neck refused to go down. On the contrary, it got worse. I got chills and it felt like something was straddling me on the futon. I couldn't open my eyes. That was the one thing I absolutely could not do. But even though I knew that, I still opened them. I was plunged into a terrifying scene. Hayashi was on my right side, performing the ritual. That thing I saw was on the other side, sitting on its knees, facing him, with me in the middle. With its hands on its knees and sitting up straight, it was peering at Hayashi's face. The gap between both of their faces was only about a fist wide. Strangely, the thing's face was tilted and twitching slowly, like an owl. I couldn't hear what it was saying, but it was muttering something while looking at Hayashi's face. Thinking back on it now, the thing was probably saying something to him. Hayashi's face dropped somewhat, and his gaze fell to the ground. Without blinking, drool started to drip from his mouth. It looked like he was smiling. Every now and then he gave a small nod. I forgot to blink and just stared at him. Suddenly, the thing's neck stopped moving. Then it turned to look at me. I panicked and closed my eyes, 
pulled the blanket up over my head and prayed with all my might. I could see the thing's face close to my own through my eyelids, twitching like an owl. It was terrifying. I heard a rattling and someone running down the stairs. It seemed Hayashi had fled. I was so scared I just stayed under the blankets. When my parents came and turned the light on, they found me curled up in a ball under the blankets, frozen. Hayashi jumped into his car without so much as even glancing at my parents and disappeared with Marumaru and his friend. I later heard from Marumaru that Hayashi didn't say a thing other than, get in the car. Far from being settled, things just got worse for me. I didn't have enough time to wait three weeks to see S-sensei. Four days passed after I saw that thing again. Of course, my neck got better, although the mark still remained, and I regained my strength as well. My fever also went down, and I didn't have any other physical problems. But that's just physically. Whether it was morning or night, I was frightened out of my mind. I was terrified that, regardless of the time, that thing might appear before me again. I couldn't sleep and barely ate, and I was constantly aware of my surroundings. In less than ten days, my face must have surely changed a lot. I was mentally driven into a wall. I didn't have much time left. As you would expect, I was unable to go to work, so my parents contacted them and let them know I would be quitting. I only heard this afterwards, but apparently when they called, there was some unpleasantness with my company. At any rate, I was scared of anything and everything. Even the washing or the persimmon tree that I could see from the window swaying in the breeze made me tremble, thinking it might be that thing. There were about two more weeks left until S-sensei was to arrive. It was too long. Unable to watch me any longer, my parents forced me into the car and drove me somewhere. My father kept telling me the whole time, Don't worry, you'll be okay. My mother sat in the back seat with me, her arm around my shoulder and rubbing my head. How many years had it been since she last did that? I had no idea what time it was, and as we drove, night fell. It's a little embarrassing, considering I was already over 20 years old, but being close to my mother like that was comforting, and for the first time in a while, I fell into a deep sleep. When I woke up, the sun was rising. Having finally slept for the first time in a while, I felt great. Apparently I'd slept for a whole day and a half. I don't think I'll ever sleep like that again. When I looked outside, I was greeted with unfamiliar scenery. But then I started to recognize where we were. A train went past in the middle of the road. We were in Nagasaki. Of course, at this I was shocked. Knowing I was scared, my parents avoided both the plane and the bullet train to take me there by car. They took several breaks along the way, but my father drove non-stop, without sleeping, while my mother stayed nearby so I wouldn't be scared. I don't think I'll ever be able to pay them back for that. My grandparents lived in a place called Yanagawa. When we arrived there, my parents stopped the car at the bottom of a hill and went to call my grandparents. Their house was up some stairs off to the side of the mountain road. I stayed back, alone, in the car. The reason both my parents went was because my grandmother had a bad back, so they needed someone to help carry some stuff to take to S-sensei's house. Even though I told them I'd be fine, I think that was proof that I was taking the situation too lightly. I'd slept for the first time in a while and we were in Nagasaki, far from Tokyo and Saitama, so I was probably feeling a little too relaxed about things. I pulled my legs up and sat cross-legged in the back seat. I was staring out the window at nothing in particular when suddenly my neck started to hurt. 
It was like nothing I'd felt until that point. It wouldn't be an exaggeration to say it was excruciating. When I put my hand to my neck, it slipped off. I was bleeding. Whether I liked it or not, when I saw the blood on my fingertips, I was pulled back to reality. But before I could feel scared or worried that that thing might be nearby, the first careless thought I had was, not again. I was so pissed off I started crying. I want you to understand me here. After finally getting a break from all those terrible things, to fall right back in it left me feeling more depressed than ever. It's tough to go back to the horrible thing you thought you had just escaped from, you know? What do you want me to do? Give me a break! I muttered to myself, crying. My parents soon returned to the car with my grandparents, but then everyone flew into a panic. I was sitting in the back of the car, curled up, crying and bleeding from the neck, so of course. What's wrong? Say something. Oh God. T-chan, just hold on. What's the matter? What are we going to do with you? Everyone shut up! I screamed unexpectedly. At the time, all I could think was that nobody could help me. There was nothing they could do. Just be quiet. Some bad shit happened. I quit my job. I was being played. Why were they running around doing things for a useless guy like me? Thinking back on it now, I feel so embarrassed about how I acted. Then, for the first and only time, my father slapped my left cheek. It really hurt. We'd had a lot of terrible verbal arguments over the years, but that was probably the first time since I was born that he ever touched me. I heard when I was younger that it was my father's policy not to raise his hand against children. He then said just one thing to me, in a quiet but strict tone. Apologise to your grandfather and grandmother. At that, I managed to calm down. I mean... I was so shocked that my feeling of despair disappeared. I apologized to everyone and composed myself, and suddenly it felt like I could take on anything. As the car took off, my grandparents gave me words of encouragement, and I was so moved that I cried again. I thought about how weak I was. When we arrived at S. Sensei's house, which doubled as a temple, I suddenly felt lighter. It wasn't like anything happened, I just suddenly felt relieved. We passed through the gate, and at the end of the narrow, stone-paved path, we were greeted by a middle-aged man. Come to think of it, it always seemed like there were guests at S. Sensei's house. There were probably a lot of people that visited her, like my grandmother. We were taken to an entrance out the back, and there was a ten tatami mat altar room there. S. Sensei was just as I remembered her. She was sitting on her knees in front of a Buddhist statue, and then slowly turned to look at me. T-chan, you'll be okay now. S. Sensei will look after you, my grandmother said. It's been a long time. You've grown up well. You're here a bit early, aren't you? S. Sensei said. S sensei will T-chan be okay? I told you, he'll be fine. We just got here. S sensei doesn't know what's going on yet, my grandfather interrupted. You be quiet. I'm just worried, is all? It was strange. Just being in S sensei's presence made my grandparents seem calmer than before. My parents and I also felt it, and as I took a deep breath and let it go, it felt like all the bad stuff was leaving my body. My parents were at their wit's end, both mentally and physically. You're tired. S Sensei will look after him now, so why don't you go and rest next door? My grandfather said to them, and led them gently to the next room. Okay, T-chan, come over here, S Sensei said. She called me over and I sat down in front of her. All right, I'd like the rest of you to also go and rest next door so I can talk to T-chan. Leave it to me. 
Until I say it's okay to return, you can't come back in here, okay? Es sensei, please help him, my grandfather said. Ti-chan, don't worry. Es sensei will fix everything. Listen carefully to what she says, okay? My grandmother said. They asked S sensei to help over and over, and as I watched them call out to me in encouragement, I started crying again. All I could do was keep crying. S sensei told me to get closer, and we sat with our knees touching. She took my hand and said nothing, looking at me for a while with a kind look on her face. I felt like I was a child, about to be scolded by my parents for something I did wrong. I was overwhelmed by this tiny, weak, older woman and her incredible presence. To think such people really exist. What shall we do with you, huh? I said nothing. Ti-chan, are you scared? Yes. Of course you are. You can't go on like this, can you? Um... Oh, don't worry about it. Just talking to myself. What do you mean, don't worry about it? It wasn't okay in the slightest. I couldn't stand it any more, and all the feelings spilt forth. I really was just an immature kid. Uh, what's going to happen to me? I'd like you to do something quickly, if possible. Just, what is it? Why is that thing following me? Just give me a break, you know? Eh, sensei can you do anything for me? Ti-chan? I mean, it's not like I've done anything wrong. Sure, I went to that ghost spot, but it wasn't just me. Why am I the only one this is happening to? Is it because I did that in front of the mirror when I wasn't supposed to? What the hell is going on? Ugh, it's pissing me off! Do, do, lulushite, do, do, lulu, jirushite. I had no idea what was going on. I can't really explain it, so I'll just write down exactly what I heard. Do, shite, do, shite. I heard a high pitched, accentless voice by my left ear, like a parrot or a budgerigar. It took me a while to realize what it was saying, over and over. Doste. Why? I looked into S. Sensei's eyes. She looked at me. But her usually kind face was emotionless. I saw something out the corner of my left eye. It was flickering. I should have given up, but I looked. I felt warm blood trickling down my neck. That thing was standing there, bent over, looking down at my face. I couldn't understand what was going on. I couldn't recognize what was happening. This was a temple, and S. Sensei was right in front of me, and yet, why? Why? It looked just like I saw a week earlier. Its face was right in front of mine, looking at me strangely and twitching like an owl. Why? 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 The question repeated over and over like a parrot. Perhaps Hayashi heard that same voice. I don't know if he heard the same word, though. I forgot to breathe. I sat there with my eyes and mouth wide open. No, to put it more correctly, it was difficult to breathe. Every now and then I gasped, like I was failing to actually take air in. While this was happening, the thing started to grab the paper talismans attached to its face and turn them over, slowly. I can't look. I knew I couldn't, and I knew I had to get away, but I couldn't move. I could already see its chin. I silently screamed. Stop! No more! But all that came out was a pitiful groan. Just when I thought I was done for, I heard a sound. Bang! To compare it to something, 
I'm not even exaggerating. It was like a spring. I thought my heart was going to explode. Bang! At that sound, I jumped up. I was sitting on my knees, so while I was struggling not to fall over, I turned around and ran at once. I wasn't thinking about anything. My body moved of its own accord. But I wasn't used to sitting on my knees, and because my legs had gone numb, I couldn't run. My legs got tangled up, and because I didn't look where I was going, I fell face first into the wall. But it didn't hurt at all, even as blood ran down my forehead. That was how much I was about to lose it. Blood trickled into my eye, and I couldn't see anything. I groped around, looking for the exit, but I couldn't find it. Not yet! Suddenly, S-Sensei screamed. I didn't know whether she was talking to me or my parents and grandparents in the next room. Either way, her voice was enough to stop me. I froze on the spot, scared. Once again, my mind was struggling to grasp the situation. I mean, there was no way for me to understand what was going on, so I just did as S-Sensei told me to. S-Sensei waited until she was sure that both myself and my parents weren't moving before she started speaking again. T-chan, I'm sorry. You must have been scared. It's okay now, so come back over here. Aisan, it's all okay now, so please wait just a little longer. I heard someone saying something incessantly on the other side of the screen door, but I don't remember what now. I wiped the blood from my face and returned to S-sensei. She handed me a towel. I don't know if it was scented, but... It smelled nice. Then I finally realized the sound I had heard earlier was S-sensei, clapping. T-chan, you saw it, didn't you? Did you hear it? Yeah, I saw it. It kept saying, why, over and over. At this point, S-sensei was back to her usual friendly face again. I focused on calming myself so I could answer her clearly. But in the end, I gave up thinking at all. Is that so? It was repeating, why? Why, do you think? I had no idea. I didn't even consider thinking about why. Um, uh, I don't know. Tichan, were you afraid just now? I was. What of? Um, well... It's not normal, and it was a ghost. My brain had reached its limits. I had no idea what S-sensei was trying to say. But it didn't do anything, did it? No. Well, my neck started bleeding, and it was trying to turn up the paper talismans on its face. I mean, that's clearly not normal. That's right. But other than that, it hasn't done anything. Has it? I said nothing. It's a tough one. Um, I'm not really following. I'm sorry. It's okay. S-sensei explained to me so I could better understand. Although it might be better to say she admonished me. First of all, it was wrong to call that thing a ghost or a monster. I asked her if it was a so-called evil spirit and with a difficult expression on her face, she said you could call it that. It was certainly something wicked, but S-sensei felt no evil will from it. As for what happened to me, she said the following. Even if it doesn't hold any ill will towards you, it's too strong, and thus this has happened. All this time, it has been lonely. It wants to talk, to touch, to be seen, to be noticed. That's what it's thinking, over and over. Tichan, you probably don't realize it, but you're kind-hearted. Other people often think of you, and they think, how nice, he seems like such a lovely person. So you couldn't help but be happy when you notice that yourself. But compared to that person, you're weak. So when it's nearby, you become scared and your body reacts. S-sensei spoke to me slowly 
using easy words like I was a child. I didn't know what to do anymore. We had decided that the thing was an evil spirit, and I thought that if S-sensei performed an exorcism, it would all be over. But S-sensei was speaking like that thing had to be protected. Well, looks like we have to do something. Tichan, it'll take a while, but I'm going to help you. At that, I was relieved. Ah, it's okay now. It's all over, I thought. I could finally relax. I'll write down what she told me. It's something I'll never forget. Even if it seems scary, and even if it's something you don't understand, I want you to think like it's suffering, just the same as you are. Think like it's extending a helping hand to you. S-sensei started to pray. Not to exorcise the ghost, but to hope that it would reach heaven. That night, even though I split my forehead and the marks on my neck were worse than before, I slept like a log. After she was done with the sutras, I was still behaving strangely, so she laughed and let us stay the night. I intended to get up early the next morning, but S-sensei had already finished her morning prayers. Good morning, Tichan. Go wash your face and have some breakfast. Once you're done, we'll head to the main temple. I wondered whether I should write much about what happened, considering the people involved, so I'll just touch upon it. The sect S-sensei belongs to is big enough that they've been included in textbooks, as I mentioned before. There are followers and practitioners all over Japan. The doctrines are the same, but geographically, there are two head temples, one in the east and one in the west. I was taken to the head temple in the west. They would take care of me for a while and help me to strengthen my virtues. Even now, I still don't know how to explain exactly what that is. S-sensei also told me they would hold a memorial service to help the thing haunting me reach heaven quicker as well. My grandmother was happiest of all upon hearing that, but my father was still suspicious. It's okay. I'll be back soon, I told him. But he said nothing. When we arrived at the head temple, a young man was waiting for us. He greeted S-sensei politely. We were taken to a cabin. I hesitate to call it that because it was rather large and magnificent. Down the far end of the main temple building and several monks greeted us. Even here, Essense kept a low profile. In reality, she was apparently quite an important person, and I later heard that if she wanted to, it wouldn't be strange for her to hold a higher position within the temple ranks. Essense said that it was sad, but there was a hierarchy. For a while, I was taken in by the head temple, and while I was treated as a guest, I also undertook the same lifestyle as everyone else there. Probably because S-sensei put in a good word for me. While I was there, I realised just how lucky I was. There was a woman who had been tormented by the evil spirit of a snake for 40 years, and a person whose parents and relatives were also cursed, causing his entire family to die out. If you followed his family lineage, it turned out they were all descendants of a fine samurai family. There were so many people other than me who were suffering, and even more than myself. Perhaps it was the lifestyle, or the place, or maybe even S-sensei's story, but my fear began to fade. Although, I was still pretty scared whenever I felt that thing suddenly appear beside me. About a month after I first went to the head temple, S-sensei came to visit. Oh my, aren't you looking well? Yes, all thanks to you. Have you seen the ghost again since that time? No, not even once. Maybe it's gone to heaven or somewhere else. I mean, this is the head temple, after all. No, that's not it. I stiffened. Oh, I'm sorry. You're still scared, aren't you? But, Ti-chan, 
There are a lot of people here who are suffering. It's our job to do whatever we can to help them, even if it's just a little. She was probably talking about the thing haunting me as well. Ti-chan, please remain here and study just a little longer. It's such a rare opportunity, after all. I did as she said. I was still being affected by what had happened that time, and I wanted to be at the temple a little longer. Plus, the days ended just like that. How can I put it? I liked how time seemed to pass slowly. Yeah, I know, that's a contradiction. In the end, I was there for around three months. S-sensei never showed her face during that time, other than the first appearance she made after the first month. Of course, without S-sensei's words of encouragement, I was a little anxious. But I was sad. As you would expect, after being isolated from my boisterous life for the last three months, I felt unsatisfied. After not seeing her for the last two months, S-sensei came to see me and my life at the head temple ended. I got dressed and greeted each person who helped me during my time, one by one, and went to leave with S-sensei. But before I knew it, she was gone. Hmm? I thought and turned around. She was a little behind me. I went back, thinking that perhaps I was walking too fast for her, and she looked at me with a kind face. Why don't we forget about going back? How about you stay here? I felt like she was recognizing my efforts at the temple over the last few months. No, I'm not like the other people here. It's not for me. Everyone here is amazing. I can't be like them, though. She blushed. That's not what I meant. Huh? I mean, it's still there. My face stiffened again. It was another two months before I was able to leave the head temple. In the end, I was there for five months in total. I don't think I'll ever be in a position again to spend such a long time away from my family, learning under the guidance of others. I think you'll be okay now, but for a while I'd like you to come back and visit the temple once a month, S-sensei said to me. They didn't know whether the thing was really gone or just hiding. My long months at the head temple ended, and I returned to normal life. My mother dealt with the cancellation of my former apartment, and all my stuff had been moved back home. When they returned to the apartment, there was this smell, like it had been fumigated, and the floor was covered in small insects. That day they were too scared to do anything and returned home. But the next day they had no choice so they summoned up the courage and went back. When they opened the door, the smell was still there, but the bugs were gone. I felt bad for my mother, but I was glad I didn't see it myself. I went home and for the first time in about half a year, I looked at my phone. Huh, I didn't even think about this all that time. There was an incredible amount of unread mail. Most of them were from Marumaru, he blamed himself for what happened to me, and there were apologies, things I should try, and people he'd found to help. He diligently tried to keep in contact with me the whole time. My mother said he even came to the house one time to ask about me. The second night after my return home, I called him. The other end of the line was noisy. I couldn't hear what he was saying. He was at a company party. I hung up and sent him a message. I'll kill you. At the end of the day, you can only rely on yourself, huh? I received a message from him the next day. I'd like to apologize, so when can I see you? The fact he messaged me and didn't call meant that he felt awkward about it. He came to the house as night fell. He traveled quite a distance. I suppose that's how bad he felt. It goes without saying that the biggest reason for that was because I hated walking around at night. When I opened the door and saw him standing there, I hit him. Twice. 
The first was so that he'd stop blaming himself. The second was for the company party he went to after I'd just gotten home, which pissed me off. Hitting someone is a lot more refreshing than pardoning them with words. And yeah, that second time was more for myself than anything. I told Marumaru everything. That night things got lively and it was just like old times. I also heard from him what happened that night after they ran out. There was something clearly wrong with Hayashi when they fled. Marumaru and his other friend knew as soon as Hayashi got back to the car that something was seriously wrong. Although Hayashi was acting weird when he jumped into the back seat, they had no choice but to leave. He was lashing out and not getting anywhere. We didn't know what was going on, Marumaru told me. When they reached the traffic lights at the exit to the highway, suddenly Hayashi jumped out of the car. He started laughing and shaking on the way, going, I'm not like that and I won't do such a thing. We were scared. I remembered him muttering over my futon and it was difficult to erase the image. As for why he didn't return to the house, he said he was simply too scared. I'm sorry I didn't have the guts, Marumaru apologised. And I forgave him. I could forgive even him. Nobody knew what happened to Hayashi after that though. In the end, it appeared that he was nothing more than a fraud and he introduced himself to Marumaru casually saying he wanted to make a bit of pocket money. You already hit me, so give me a break, Marumaru said. But since he was the one who brought the situation about, he got into contact with whoever he could after that. But he was unable to find anyone with concrete information and could only find bits and pieces. There are a bunch of conditions you have to meet and sometimes when things line up, something happens, was all he would say. After that, I kept my word to S-sensei and went to visit her once a month. For the first year, it was once a month, then the next year, it was once every three months. After apologizing to me, Marumaru came to visit me more and more often, and whenever I visited and returned from seeing S-sensei, he always made sure to contact me. Two years after I first saw that thing, S-sensei said to me, You don't have to worry anymore. Tichan, feel free to just drop by and show your face every now and then, but don't do anything stupid, okay? Was it really over? I didn't know. Three months later, S-sensei passed away. I admired and respected her and wanted to learn more from her, but I wanted to believe that it was all over now. Two months passed after her funeral. Feelings of sadness and loss started to fade and I returned to my normal life. Although my days were busy, there were times during the day where I would suddenly remember what happened. It was so separated from reality that I sometimes wondered whether it really happened or not. I didn't need to tell anyone about it and there was no reason to. I just lived each day to the fullest. Amongst all of this normality, I received a single letter from my grandmother. When I opened the envelope, another page fell out. The letter from my grandmother went as follows. This is a letter I received from S-sensei. The 49th day after her death has passed, so as I promised to her, I'm now giving it to you. S-sensei's letter. It's impossible for me to confirm if what she wrote is true now, and I hesitated about writing it down, but I'm going to dive in and do it. To Ti-chan. It's been a long time. This is S. It's been a while since everything happened, hasn't it? Are you doing well? I hope you haven't had any more frightening experiences. I'm sorry, I really shouldn't be so indirect considering my age, huh? I'm writing to you today to apologize. It's not that I did something terrible. There was nothing else we could do at the time. But I'm sorry. That day you came to see me, I was honestly terrified. What you brought with you that day was quite impossible for me to deal with. But you were frightened, 
weren't you? So I thought that I mustn't be afraid. To speak truthfully, as much as I wanted to help you, I was no match for it. You were really lucky that time, hey? Tichan, how was your time at the head temple? Were you able to take your mind off things? Every time I saw you there, I told you that you weren't ready, right? Do you remember? I thought if you returned home, something bad would happen again. That's why, even though I knew it would be boring for a young man such as yourself, I couldn't let you leave. I prayed every day, but it would appear that spirit didn't want to leave. But you should be okay now. It doesn't appear like it's nearby anymore. But Tichan, if… if something bad happens, please visit the head temple right away. I have no doubt you can get stronger there, and things shouldn't get too out of hand. There's one last thing I have to tell you. If things get too tough, please entrust yourself to Buddha. When things get so bad that all seems lost, please prepare yourself. I don't intend to let you die, but supposing it's not over yet, then there may be more tough times in your future. You met a lot of people at the head temple, didn't you? Evil spirits honestly like to take their time when tormenting someone. You can't just end it. When they see someone suffering, they smile and chuckle about it. It's regrettable, but there are times when we can't do anything and can do nothing but watch as others suffer before us. We want to help them, but there's so much we can't do. I did absolutely everything I could because I wanted to help you, Tichan, but honestly, I'm not so confident that it worked. I can't sense it anymore, and I think it's gone, but you have to stay sharp. It's possible it's just waiting for the chance to strike again. Okay, Tichan? You can't take it easy. Always take precautions, never approach suspicious places, and never do anything silly. Believe me, okay? I'm sorry for all the lies. I know it's selfish to ask you to believe me, but please believe that I prayed to Buddha to help you until the end. I'll continue praying for you to enjoy a long, healthy life. S. As I was reading the letter, I realized my hands were shaking. I broke out into a clammy sweat. My heart was beating faster. What was I supposed to do? It wasn't over yet? I suddenly felt like that thing was watching me from somewhere. There was no way to escape from it. Ever? It was potentially just hiding, and if it wanted to, it could appear before me at any time. Once I started to doubt things, that was it. I started to think of everything suspiciously. Was S-sensei tormented by that thing? Is that why she left me the letter? In the end, nothing had changed? Was Hayashi haunted by it? What exactly did it whisper to him? Wasn't it strange that, unlike with me, it said something to him directly? S-sensei lied to me so I wouldn't be worried, but was it something so bad that she had to lie about it? If that were the case, did that mean that knowing that, she worried about me until the very end? I got more confused the more suspicious I became. I didn't know what to do. Up until this point is everything I know. Over two and a half years, I honestly don't know whether it's all over or not yet. In the end, I still don't understand why it happened, and nobody has been able to help me, nor is there anyone close to me who knows something about it. Was it summoned by some uncertain knowledge gained from somewhere? Or perhaps there is some causal relationship to it. I don't know anything. The only thing I can say is that it happened purely by chance. But if that were true, it's too harsh for something that happened entirely by chance. Am I being punished for some crime I committed? I never did anything bad though. And even if that's so, why? It's unfair. That's how I honestly feel. If there is something I can tell you, this is it. If you're being targeted, followed, or possessed, I'll say once more that it's no joke. Even if someone tells you it's all over, 
you mustn't take things easy. And finally, there's something I must apologise for. I've told several white lies throughout this story. This was in order to make some things easier to understand, and there were a few things I didn't understand myself, so please ignore them. That probably made some parts of the story more difficult to understand. Please forgive me for that. But that's not the only thing I want to apologise for. There's something more fundamental to the construction of this story that I've lied about. You might not have noticed, and I was careful so that you wouldn't realise it. I did so because I thought I wouldn't be able to convey the story clearly otherwise. There were parts of the story that may have seemed contradictory, right? You probably felt disappointed. But I wanted someone to know about what happened. I'm Marumaru. Even if I try to repent now, it's too late. Another massive thank you and shout out to this week's Kamitia member, Jojo. It's thanks to your support, along with everyone else, that I'm able to keep doing this show. So thank you very much. Don't forget to check out Toshiden Volume 3, available on Amazon right now. And if you'd like to chat about this week's stories, come and join us in the Koobana Discord. You can find that link in the description or on koobana.net. You can also check out our Patreon at patreon.com slash Tara A. Devlin for exclusive bonus stories and extras, or our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash koobana japan for all sorts of Japanese horror you won't find anywhere else. Thanks guys, stay safe, and I'll see you again next time for even more koobana, true Japanese scary stories from around the internet. Want even more scary stories? Head over to koobana.net for new translations every week. You can also join our Patreon for exclusive stories you won't find anywhere else. Head over to koobana.net now. <laughs>